Hey, 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 good morning. All right. Wonderful singing. Thank you, Lord, for our voices. Amen. This morning when I wake up, I'm excited. And uh, I got more excited when uh, I saw in the group chat, um, Brother Ryan greeted everybody good morning. And then Brother Derek followed it up with Happy Lord's Day. And that get me more excited. I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. <laughs> I don't want to lose control, no. <laughs> but I like it. All right. Magadang, 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 baga. That means good morning 20 times in Tagalog. <laughs> now, that's a challenge for everybody. Brother Ryan, have you been practicing that? Want to give it a try? <laughs> okay. All right. Beyond comfort zone. Interesting. The scripture reading this morning that was read a while ago my brother Alex. Oh, by the way, um, thank you to Mr. Eva, Mr. Eva, for helping out in the uh, in our multimedia. She's doing a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, also, before I go proceed and proceed to our lesson. I would like to thank everybody for um, going out of their way, you know, with the things, with the uh, ministry that this congregation has been doing, helping out, that was even announced a while ago, helping out our brothers in the Philippines and reaching out to the homeless. Thank you very much. God is pleased with all of you. Amen. Amen. And uh, good morning. First time to meet our sister Lourdes and brother Pedro Santos. Good morning. They're at the back. Good morning. All right. Again, the scripture that was read a while ago. Um, it is about the encounter between uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay. And in, in verse 5, in verse 5 of... Uh, Acts chapter 8, now we can see in that particular verse that Philip was actually in Samaria. He was in Samaria preaching the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's doing very well in Samaria. Now, come verse 26. Okay? In verse 26, it says there, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. Okay, some manuscripts or some scholars say that it is a deserted road, a deserted place. Whether it be a desert place, a desert road, or a deserted place, okay, it won't matter in our discussion. Now, from the old Samaria to Gaza, okay, where Philip was, and then he went to Gaza. That is actually 69 miles. Okay? That's 69 miles. And Philip, okay, and Philip probably, you know, walked from Samaria going to Gaza. That is 69 miles. And he left behind a fruitful work in Samaria. And by walking non-stop, according to some simple calculation, non-stop walk, it would take him around 18 to 20 hours from Samaria to that place in Gaza. Okay? 
Now, with some sleep and rest in between, it would probably uh, take him a good one and a half days walk. Now, so Philip was told to go on a day's journey. Okay? Being comfortable in Samaria and having a fruitful work in Samaria, he was told to go somewhere in Gaza and walk a one and a half day. And without even knowing what he's going to do there. Right? If you go again and read Acts chapter 8, verse 26, it was not told and it was not written there what he's going to do in Gaza when he got there. Okay? That's the number one. Let's go out beyond our comfort zone in our obedience to God. Okay. What is obedience? Obedience, according to some Bible dictionary, to hear God's word and act accordingly. Through hearing or obedience, it involves the physical hearing that inspires the hearer and the belief or trust that in turn motivates the hearer to act in accordance with the speaker's desire. So, from the definition of what obedience is, we can say that obedience to God, it means to hear, it means to trust, it means to submit, to surrender to God, and do whatever He asks of us. That is true obedience. Now, obedience, we must never take it lightly. Our obedience to God, it must never be taken lightly. Because from the Old Testament and to the New Testament, the significant usage of obedience is that every or the very fiber, the very fiber that holds the relationship of man to God, it holds that relationship of man to God, it is the fiber that holds it. And without obedience, there can be no genuine faith. And faith, as we know of, faith is needed to be pleasing to God. Because according to Hebrews chapter 11, without faith, it is impossible to please to God. And so remember that obedience is the ultimate test of faith in God. Amen. It is, the, it is the ultimate test of our faith in God. So therefore, faith and obedience is paramount to our relationship with God. Now, oftentimes, you will be asked by God to leave your comfort zone and go to a desert. He will ask you to get up and go to a desert to a place that you've never been before, to a place where you don't know what you're going to do when you get to that place. Just like what happened to Philip. And there were times <laughs> that God will ask you to do something, to do something that you don't have any clue of what you will do. Just like Philip. Philip does not have any clue of what is there in the desert. He knows probably what is there in the desert, but he doesn't know what is actually there, why God wants him to be there in the first place. But you know, you just have to go because you know that God is calling you. And obedience is that you don't have to know where you are going if you know whom you are following. If you know that you are following God, you don't have to know, brother and sister, where you're going. Because you know that you are following your master. And you know that you're in good hands, right? Amen? Amen. You know that you're in good hands. You know that God will never put you in a place that will be detrimental to your health. That will be detrimental to your life. He will not. And he will never do that. So you don't have to know where you're going if you know whom you are following. And this is trust right here. 
That is trust. That is genuine faith in the Lord. And trust, it is very much part of our obedience to God. Even if sometimes it defies human logic. Sometimes you will have to think. You will be into thinking, what? You want me to go there? You want me to do that? Sometimes it defies our thinking. It defies our logic. But you know, you just got to go. You just got to go. Because the master is telling you to go. You have to leave your comfort zone and go out. Because remember that in God, there is no accident. Everything is planned. And there's always good that will come out of his plan. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, look at these people. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac on the altar. God asked Abraham, Hey, Abraham, give me your son. Offer your son to me. You see, that defies logic. That defies human reasoning. Lord, you want me to kill my son? You want me to offer my son to you? And God said, yes. But what Abraham did, he just got up and offered his son without any question. Hebrews chapter 11, 24 to 26, by faith, Moses, when he was grown, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer oppression to, with God, with God's people, rather than experience the fleeting enjoyment of sin. He valued grace or disgrace for Christ above the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his reward. You see, Moses had everything. He was comfortable. In Egypt, you have everything. But the Bible tells us he valued disgrace for Christ. He rather suffered with Christ than have all the treasures in Egypt. He rather be disgraced with Christ rather than have all the accolades of the people in Egypt. Why? For he was looking. For a reward. Aren't we all looking for a reward in heaven? Okay. You see, these people, they went out of their comfort zone. They go beyond comfort zone because of their obedience to God. Are we doing the same? Beyond comfort zone. Going beyond our comfort zone in our devotion to God. Acts chapter 8, <coughs> 27, excuse me. So he started out. So Philip started out his walk. And he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Kandake, or Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. The queen's name is not Kandake. Kandake means the queen mother. It's like a title, like a pharaoh. Okay. So Philip started to walk a good one and a half day, and then he met the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's look at this. The long and winding road. The long and winding road. See, the, the eunuch, he was traveling or going back from Jerusalem to worship God. He's going back to his hometown in Ethiopia. They say that from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, Ethiopia to Jerusalem, one way, they say it's 1,000 to 1,500 miles, depending on where you're going to take your route. Let's say it's 1,200 miles. 
that's a good one month travel on a chariot. Can you imagine? One way. Just going from Ethiopia, going to Jerusalem, that will take you one month. Do you like to travel that far? On a chariot, without air condition, without radio, without MP3, without DVD. Or oh, do you still have DVD? Without Netflix on your vehicle. Without all of those things that make us comfortable inside our vehicle. It's a grueling travel. It's costly. Can you imagine traveling one month? Of course, you have to eat. So you have to pack all the things that you need. Put it all in the chariot. And it's risky. Risky because there would be some people who will try to rob you along the way. There would be some people who would try to kill you along the way. See? A good 1,200 miles on a chariot. Wow. Devotion is an eager inclination, a strong attachment, love or affection, zeal, especially feelings towards God appropriately expressed by acts of worship. That is what devotion is. And this man from Ethiopia, he was so devoted to God that he was willing to travel a month just going there and probably stay for a, probably a week or so in Jerusalem and then travel back again a month's time going back to his hometown in Ethiopia. He is doing that on a regular basis because of his devotion to God. Come on. Because he loved the Lord. Example of devotion, Acts 17.23 For us, I passed by and beheld your devotions, the objects of your worship. This is when Paul when he was passing by, he found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare unto you. There are those people, they are so devoted in worshiping gods that they even have a inscription. They put something and it says there to the unknown God. There are people that are so devoted to the unknown God. Okay? That is devotion. In Galatians chapter 1, 13 and 14, For you have heard of my former way of life in Judaism, how severely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and was extremely jealous. Paul was extremely devoted in his former way of life being Judaism. And being so, he was so dedicated. If you're going to read verse 12, he went out. Or verse 13, again, he went out and he severely persecuted and tried to destroy the church of our Lord. Jesus Christ. That was his devotion before he became Paul. When he was sold, that was him. He was so devoted in persecuting the church. So that's what devotion means. You see, just like the devotion of those pagan worshipers in the book of Acts and the devotion of Paul in his former life in Judaism, those were all wrong forms of devotions. But the eunuch, the eunuch have it all right. He was devoted to the right God and his actions clearly speaks about it. His actions were right before God. He have it all right. Now again, <laughs> if we look at it again, he traveled 1,200 miles. He traveled a month long 
in a grueling desert, a grueling trouble that cost him so much, not only finances, but it will cost him his life. See? But the question is, how devoted are we to God? How devoted are we to God? How often do we talk to God? How many hours do we spend a day connecting to God by reading and studying the scriptures? Are we excited every Sunday to go to church without really mindful of the reason why? Because so many people are just going to church where it's like a habit of them just to go to church. That it becomes a habit that they are not really mindful of the reason why they go to church. Some people are just going to church because they were forced by their sisters, because they were forced by their parents, because they were forced by their children. The parents were forced by the children to come with them. The children were forced by the parents to come with them. We must worship God with all our hearts. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all our being. Or maybe we are more excited the after church. Probably we are more excited of the lunch out after the church service rather than the church service itself. Or maybe we are looking at our watch and see if how long Brother Carlos has been talking. Or Brother Mike is talking. Or Brother Rex is talking. <laughs> you see, are we forsaking the assembly? Are we forsaking the worship? Probably because we have some appointments, some celebrations to go during Sunday. Are we canceling any work scheduled for ministry? Are we canceling? work scheduled for the Lord because oh, it's hot outside. Oh, it's raining. How are we devoted to God? Or when we transfer to a new place and looking for the nearest congregation only to find out that the nearest congregation is one hour or two hours drive. Are we going to go to that congregation or are we going to watch it on Facebook? Or are we just going to watch it on Zoom? Now just, just out of curiosity, who traveled the farthest just to go here? Who traveled the farthest? On a weekly basis. I know Sister Lourdes and Brother Pedro from Sacramento. How far did you travel to come here? Two hours. Who else? I think Brother Todd. How long? Hour 15. Okay. Who traveled more than an hour 15 except for the Sanchez right there? Who we'll traveled an hour 15, more than an hour 15? Nobody? Thank God, Brother Todd and Sister Liana. God bless you. You see, well, probably they have reasons why they come here. And I know for a fact that there would be some congregations near your place, right? But they chose to come here. I don't know. What's the reason behind? But to travel one hour, 15 minutes, to travel two hours, that's devotion. That's sacrifice. You see, every week, Brother Todd, Sister Eliana, and their sons, every week they are here. They have to travel one 
hour, 15 minutes, one hour, 30 minutes, sacrificing gasoline, sacrificing their time for the Lord because they love the Lord. I know all of us love the Lord. That's why you are all here. I know that. I know that. But you see, this person came all the way from Ethiopia just to worship God, traveled one month one way. Now this guy, this guy was so determined in his devotion to fulfill, fulfill his devotion to worshiping God. And his devotion kept him going to Jerusalem despite of what he had to go through. And that devotion of him led him out beyond his comfort zone. Now, another interesting I want to share with you regarding this eunuch. Okay. This person, he was a eunuch. And what is a eunuch? What is a eunuch? In the Bible, eunuchs are generally defined as castrated men, meaning they have their testicles cut out, removed. And either they have their testicles removed or they have their private part removed or both. They are in place in charge over a king's harem of wives and concubines. So in general, that is the definition of what a eunuch is. Okay. Now, here's the thing. In Deuteronomy 23 verse 1, an eunuch whose testicles are broken or cut away or yard cut off shall not enter into the church of the Lord. A eunuch is not allowed to enter any temple. He was not allowed to enter any church of the Lord, any fellowship. He was not allowed. In Leviticus 22, 25, neither shall you offer as the bread of your God any such animals gotten from a foreigner, since there is a blemish in them because of their mut uh, mutilation, they will not be accepted for you. Even if a priest, he was not allowed to get any sacrifice from a eunuch because that eunuch was deemed unclean because of the mutilation that happened to him. So that sacrifice of the priest from the eunuch will not be accepted. Now, imagine this property of the building. Imagine this as the temple in Jerusalem. The temple of Jerusalem is this fence property of the church build, church property across that street, onto that street. That is the temple, including the streets, okay? The temple. So, the eunuch, assuming that he was castrated, because there, there is this what they call a Jewish proselyte, that he was not castrated. But assuming that this person, he was castrated, he is not allowed to go inside the temple. He was only allowed in the outermost part of the temple. That is, he is only allowed up to in that street, on that street. Because there would be a fence. The street is part of the temple. That is the outer part of the temple. And before going to the inner courts of the temple, there would be what is called soreg. Soreg is a, a fence, a wall. And imagine the soreg is the fence line of this building. Right there at the side of the back. Any individual who's unclean, who's not a Jew, is not allowed in the inner courts. They are only allowed outside of the Sorek to the outermost part of the temple court, which is called the Gentile court. That is why it is called the Gentile court, because those 
that are Gentiles, not belonging to the Jews, they are only allowed up to that place. Now, can you imagine this eunuch? He probably knew that he will not be allowed to enter the inner court to worship. But still, he made the one month trouble. He traveled one month knowing that I will not be allowed to enter the inner court and do my worship to God. But still, he went. He went. Why? Because he wants to fulfill his devotion in worshiping the Lord. Even, Lord, if I will only be at the outer part of the temple, I will go there and worship you. Amen. You see, the long and winding road that brought not me, but the you know to that door in the temple courts, outside of the temple courts, to fulfill his devotion to God. You see, what kind of devotion this man had to God. That's why in one of the accounts in Acts, the people were outraged with Paul. In Acts chapter 21, 28 to 29, the people were shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, referring to Apostle Paul, and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought a Greek, or he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled his holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian in the city with Paul, and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. You see, bringing someone into the temple courts, inside the temple courts, that is not a Jew, that is not an Israelite, that is defiling the holy temple of the Lord. And what did the people do? The whole city, they arose, and the people came running from all directions. They seized Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. They want to kill Paul, because Paul apparently brought someone, brought a Greek inside the temple that defiles the holy place. You see, again, assuming that this person falls into that category that he was castrated, he knows that he will not be allowed inside the temple court to sacrifice. But he was so willing, he was so willing to sacrifice his time he was so willing to sacrifice his effort. He was so willing to sacrifice his money just to be able to fulfill his devotion, his love for the master and to worship God into the temple. See, just wow. Amazing, isn't it? You know, he did not let the thought of not being able to enter to that inner courts deter him. He did not. Now, how many of us Christians who put up so many excuses just so not to be in the assembly or not to have time for the Lord? Many are even complaining. Many are even murmuring for the time we spend in our worship service to God. You know, the preacher took so long. The preacher took so long. 45 minutes, one hour, one hour and a half. The announcement took so long. The prayer was so long. The singing was so long. We are already hungry. We are starting to be uncomfortable. People are complaining. On the hour, they spent worshiping the Lord in this chapel or in, in any congregations. But there are Christians worshiping under a tree. But there are Christians worshiping in just 10 minutes into the worship hall. They are all be sweating. They are all being perspiring because it's so hot. It's so humid. There's not enough electric fan to cool them off. But they are not complaining. They are happy. They are excited because they have this true love in God. 
You know, there was one brother I've listened to, and he, he, he had a mission somewhere in Africa. And he was asked by the local brother there, he was asked, brother, how far do you walk from your car to the worship building? And this brother, he was thinking because he would only walk from the parking lot, from parking his car, just a few steps just to go to the building. And, and he told the brother, asking him, well, I walk, but not as far as you walk. You see, because those people in that remote place somewhere in Africa, they walk miles just to be in the church building. See? And there are worshipers, even barefoot, walk miles just to worship the Lord. And yet, many Christians, we are complaining because we are uncomfortable. Many Christians are murmuring because we are uncomfortable. Because we don't have cushions in those seats. But there are churches sitting on the pavement. There are churches, there are congregations who have no cushion. They are uncomfortable if we look at them, but they are comfortable because they are serving the Lord. Beyond comfort zone, we should go where the lost are. You know, Philip, again, traveled for a day just to be with the eunuch, a single soul. He could have declined God and tell God, Lord, send someone. I'm so busy here. I'm doing great in the ministry here in Samaria. Why, is, why send me? Send someone else. You know, but he didn't do it. And he still went. Follow the Lord. That tells us that every single soul is important to God. Every single soul. Now, when Philip accepted Jesus Christ, he knew. What was his role? He knew that he would be a servant. And I'm pretty sure that we all know our role in the Lord's kingdom. I'm pretty sure that we all know that we will be a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And you all know your mandate in the Lord. When Jesus came, came down from heaven to earth, he, know, he knew his mandate. He knew his mandate, that he would have to save souls, that he would have to reach those souls. And he never complained. And Philip never did complain when he was sent to Gaza. Our mandate is to preach the gospel to all, to all people, and in everywhere. Everywhere you and I are capable of going and are capable of doing so. Jesus knew his mandate from the Father. When he came down, when he said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those that are lost. The Lord knew that people are lost. And that these people are need to be found soon. The Lord understand <clears throat> what these people are going through. He knew that these people needs to hear the word. He knew that these people needs to understand the message. So they can have a better life with him and soon be with him in heaven. So he went. Jesus went. Now he is sending all of us out there. He is sending you. Just like the eunuch where God have it in his mind that he will come and he would get him. God is likewise saying that he is going to get those who are still outside of his church wherever they may be. <clears throat> and God is sending you, Sister Jesse. God is sending you, Brother Jerry. 
God is sending you. She said, Gloria, God is sending you, Brother Big. God is sending all of us out there to save those souls, even <coughs> one soul. Remember that good news is never a good news if, it's, if it is not shared. So don't keep the good news to yourselves. You know, people are not coming here. They are not coming in here. Trust me. Believe me. If they do, it takes so many years. But we need to go out there. We need to get up from our comfortable chairs <coughs> excuse me, and start warming those feet and legs of ours and go out and walk. Go out and talk to someone. Go out and spread the good word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ told us to preach the gospel to all. Jesus Christ mandated us to go in every place that we could go. You know, you may not want to go to that alley. You may not want to go to that place because the people right there, you don't like the way, probably the way they look. Probably you don't like because they're ugly. They are terrifying because they don't dress very well. Probably you don't want to talk to that person because that person stinks. Probably you don't want to, that, you don't want to talk to that person because probably that person, when he talks, his saliva is all over the place. You know? But we have to go out there. We have to embrace them. We have to share them the gospel. Because you know why? If no one, if no one, and if God was not so willing to send someone to you when you were out there, when you were lost at the time, when no one like Philip was sent to you, you will still be out there in your sins. But lo and behold, God loves you. Lo and behold, God cares for you. God loves me. God cares for me. Lo and behold, God sent someone to you. Lo and behold, God sent a Philip to you so that you can be converted like this Ethiopian eunuch which was baptized and he went on rejoicing. Hallelujah. Amen. See? Go out beyond your comfort zone. Even for a single soul. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, Apostle Paul, when he said that he became all things to all men, that he may by all means save some. Wow. I want to be all things in men so that by God's grace and mercy and love, I could even, just even one soul, bring to his name. See, we should go out there, out in our comfort zone to save that one soul. You know, the disciples went and preached the gospels with the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, those hypocrites who claimed to be righteous did not go. Jesus and his disciples went where most of us Christians won't dare to go. And we just try to leave it to the other guy doing what we're supposed to do. Leaving it to the other guy doing it all. What we are all supposed to do. Now, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, don't expect your wife. Don't expect your husband. Don't expect your child. Don't expect your siblings. Don't expect your kin, don't expect your friends to be saved when you are not sharing the gospel that saves them. Don't expect a tree in your backyard to grow if you did not plant any seed. Right? What I'm saying, you have to connect. We have to connect with these people and plant the seed 
the word of God and by God's grace and mercy, let that word work in them. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. P.T. Barnum once said, comfort is the enemy of progress. Maybe he's right. Being comfortable takes away somehow our desire to do more in God's vineyard. Maybe we are so comfortable in ourselves thinking that we are already saved because we go to church every Sunday. We attend every Bible study and we are just a good person that we don't bother anymore to share the gospel to someone and to reach out the lost souls. If that's the case, we need 100, we need to think 100 times, brothers and sisters, what our Christianity is all about because we are missing the point of servanthood. We are missing the point, point of, ser- of a Christ-centered life. You know, being comfortable is really subjective. For example, we are comfortable at the setup. But when God brings you to a different environment where it is hot, your seat has no cushion, you won't be comfortable. But for those who are used to it, it's comfortable for them. Now look at it this way. Because of your devotion to God, you will sacrifice. If you were brought to that environment because of your devotion to God, you will sacrifice and you will learn to adapt to your new environment and pretty soon you are so adapted to it, you will be comfortable without sitting on a cushion. You will be comfortable praising the Lord even when it's hot. You will not be complaining because you are so adapted. You won't be complaining because you are so adapted and your devotion to God really sink into you that even if it is hot, it's okay with you because you love the Lord. And maybe so, that comfort is really the enemy of our devotion to God. Sometimes again, we are so comfortable that it takes away our devotion to God. My dear brothers and sisters, the word is yours. I would like to invite those who have not truly accepted the Lord, please come forward. Make your voice be heard. And let God come to you. Let the word of God change you, transform you, convert you into a real servant and be saved. And to all of us, my dear brothers and sisters, continue serving God even when it's not comfortable. Sometimes we need to be uncomfortable to be comfortable. Shall we all stand as we see the song of the